muted to ensure that all participants are able to hear clearly. If you are having a hard time hearing the webinar at any point, please let us know via the chat function. Um, we would really like to hear from you and would like to include your voice in the conversation. So ask questions, share comments, even challenge our ideas. Use the question and answer panel on the right side of your GoToWebinar player to ask questions or share comments at any point throughout the webinar. Uh, we will answer questions at the end of the webinar, but again, encourage you to submit your questions as they arrive. So why are we hosting this webinar today? We have heard from mayors and city councilors that we work with throughout the region that complete streets are a priority in communities, especially at this time of year when people are getting excited to get outdoors again, maybe start jogging or bicycling or walking to work. We are pleased to provide information and tools that can make it easier and safer for your residents to walk, bike, and commute safely. After participating in this webinar, we are confident that you will understand what complete streets are, what they are not, and how they promote safety, health, and economic development in communities. So what are complete streets? The streets of our cities and towns are an important part of our communities. They allow children to get to school and parents to get to work. They bring together neighbors and draw visitors to neighborhood stores. These streets ought to be designed for everyone, whether young or old, on foot or on bicycle, in a car or in a bus. But too often, they are designed only for speeding cars or creeping traffic jams. Complete streets are streets for everyone. They are designed and operated to enable safe access for all users. Pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists, and public transportation users of all ages and abilities are able to safely move along and across a complete street. Complete streets make it easy to cross the street, walk to shops, and bicycle to work. They allow buses to run on time and make it safe for people for people to walk to and from train stations. Americans want choices. We know that people want the freedom to choose. They want to know that they have options to get where they need to go, whether that's on foot, by bicycle, on public transportation, or their car. Currently, folks a majority of people feel like they don't have a choice, that they're relegated to using their car, that that's really the only way that they can get around. And I'm sure that any of you who commute by car and spend some time in traffic, especially in this greater DC region, you'd love to spend less time in a car. So people want more options that don't force them to rely solely on moving around by cars. Most Americans feel providing more transportation options will reduce congestion, not building or expanding roads. There's a tremendous potential to convert short trips from driving to walking and bicycling. So we see here on this slide that close to 40% of all trips taken are less than three miles, and 17% of those are less than one mile. But even among those trips that are less than one mile, almost half of those are driven. And when we think about it, a mile is not that far to walk. But again, this goes back to the choices that people have to make. And when our, when our roads are designed only for people to drive, rather than for people to have the freedom to make the choice about whether they want to walk that one mile or bike that one mile, instead the majority are forced to use and rely solely on their cars. Mm -hmm. Walking is the second most common form of travel, representing 10.9% of all trips. However, a full third of Americans report not taking a walking trip in the last week. Studies show how unsafe people feel on the roads in their communities due to a lack of sidewalks, poor lighting, and too few crosswalks. These problems with the built environment keep people from walking, biking, and getting to transit. 
Likewise, walking and bicycling are often the only viable option for low-income residents to get to physical activity. And what's great about what this slide shows is that every single trip starts and ends with walking. Um, we think about if you're walking to public transportation, unless you live directly above or across the street from a metro stop or a bus stop, you have to walk a couple of blocks or down the road to get there. And if you use bike share, if you live in a city that has bike share, you have to walk to the bicycle share station. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities if we make our streets more usable for pedestrians to increase walking. And people will walk. What's great about this slide is that it shows the percentage of people that are willing to walk to destinations within a certain um, distance. So we can see that people are less than, that only 1% of people are willing to walk the great distance of three to four miles, but nearly half of the, half, almost 50% of people are willing to walk a mile to church or school. And then we see over one third of people are willing to walk a mile to work, but again, not as many people willing to walk three to four miles. Mm -hmm. And if you remember back to the slide that we showed earlier, such a large percentage of trips are within, within one mile. So there's a great opportunity. People want to walk. People want the op people want choices. They don't want to have to rely on their on their cars. So, who wants complete streets? Complete streets policies are important for older adults who want to remain in their communities and stay mobile. That makes complete streets very important for our nation. As by 2025, the number of people over the age of 65 will more than double to about 62 million, representing 18% of the population, nearly one in five Americans. The AARP report cited here also notes that two-thirds of planners and engineers have not begun to prepare for this. The 2009 National Household Travel Survey found that the percent of people who have stopped driving doubled each decade after the age of 65. About half of non-drivers do not travel at all, but would like to. The opportunities to take transit, to bike safely, and to walk safely makes travel to the store, doctor, or visits to family and friends impossible. Who, another group that wants complete streets are millennials. And this is something we hear about on the news all the time. Millennials burning their cars, they want to live in cities, they want to live places that they can walk and bike to. The annual miles traveled by car among 16 to 34 year olds dropped 23% from 2001 to 2009. And miles traveled by drivers under 20 dropped, 21 dropped from 21% to 14% of the total between 1995 and 2005. When we build incomplete streets, there are consequences. Of the pedestrians killed in 2007 and 2008, more than 50% died on main roadways typically designed to be wide and fast. Roads like this are built to move cars and too often have not met the needs um, of pedestrian or bicycle bicyclists safely. Additionally, we know that providing the infrastructure such as sidewalks does keep people safe because more than 40% of deaths Occur, pedestrian deaths occurred when there was no sidewalk. So it's obvious that people need to walk and want to walk, and we want to make it safe for them to be able to walk. Pedestrian safety is a health and equity issue. Um, Latino pedestrian fatality rate is 60% higher for whites. For African Americans, it's 70%, 75% higher than for whites. Uh, African Americans are roughly 12% of the population, but 20% of pedestrian deaths. In counties where more than 20% of households have incomes below the federal poverty line, the pedestrian fatality rate is over 80% higher than the national average. Adults over 65 make up 22% of the pedestrian fatalities from 2000 to 2009, despite being only 13% of the population. And those 75% and older were more than twice as likely to be killed while walking as those under 65. 
Older Latino adults are especially vulnerable with a pedestrian fatality rate that is 173% higher than that of older white adults. So incomplete streets um, are inadequate when there's no sidewalk, when it's too dangerous to cross on foot. We see in this picture that it's a very wide street with many lanes of traffic, but there, and there's no pedestrian um, infrastructure at all. Streets are inadequate when bicyclists cannot safely access um, the streets. And as we see here, when there's traffic and there's um, cars, there's congestion, and there's really no place for the bicyclist to be. There's no dedicated space. There's no place for that bicyclist to safely navigate through that turning lane. Many communities currently have overworked street networks that force neighborhood traffic onto larger arterial roads. This creates unsafe traffic congestion and can be dangerous for drivers. And we hear this story a lot in the greater Washington region. We hear reports about the congestion of our region, about the increase and about the projected increase of congestion in our region. Um, and when we have this congestion, there is just too many people trying to use the street and too many crashes. And we really need to diversify our transportation network with walking and biking. Public transit riders are very important users of the street and should be taken into account. Public transit trips begin and end with a walk or a bike trip. And we need to make sure that bus stops are safe places not only to be able to get to the bus stop safely, but to wait for the bus safely. Persons using mobility devices have just as much of a right to a safe street as a car or a bicyclist or a pedestrian. There is a heightened need as this group of people depends on using the street in a specific way to travel in their daily life. And we need to be able to make them accessible for wheelchairs and for people using canes or walkers. And it's important to note that as we make streets accessible for a wheelchair user, we also make it easier for the person that maybe has broken their leg and is temporarily on crutches or for the parent that's pushing a stroller. So this really Making these streets complete for all users really benefits everybody. So in general, streets are inadequate when there is just no room for people. Here you see this group of people. They were dropped off at a bus stop, but the bus stop had nowhere to go. And so they are trying to get either a stroller or somebody in a wheelchair up you know, the side of an embankment so that they can access the retail that is on the street. But we know how to do it right. There are examples all over the United States, and there are examples right here in the region that have that are with streets that are built with all users in mind. And so here we have a great example of a street that is built to accommodate public transit. It's built to accommodate walking, and also it's built with plenty of parking. We know uh, how to use bike lanes to give cyclists dedicated space, which has also been shown that drivers prefer to, for cyclists to have dedicated space because it's a clear delineation of where everybody should be on the road. I think it's also important to note that bike lanes might not be appropriate for every single street, but in, in certain cases, such as this street where we have you know, a wider street and, and three, at least three lanes of traffic, bike lanes are definitely an appropriate treatment. Yet, we still end up with streets that look like this. Very wide streets, faded crosswalks, no pedestrian median or refuge. So if you were crossing the street, you'd have to make it all the way across um, in one cycle, or you would be left waiting kind of in the middle of traffic. This is not a place where people want to walk. Um, people do not feel safe. I would definitely not feel safe here. And it's, you know, it was really built only for cars, and we want to make sure that Complete streets make sure that it's built for everybody. Um, most people that walk in bicycles are also drivers. And so it's not that we want to exclude cars. It's that we want a street that's inclusive. And I would say most drivers probably don't like to drive on that street either. <laughs> um, so we also do not want to see piecemeal pedestrian and bike infrastructure. This is important because a pedestrian or a bicyclist just wants to reach a destination place safely. They don't realize that they're crossing different jurisdictional lines. Um, a complete streets policy in, in, in all communities ensures that we are looking at the pedestrian, the bicyclist, and the transit user 
comprehensively across the region and that everybody arrives safely no matter how they choose to take their trip. And the solutions are sometimes common sense. So we can look at this picture and we immediately see that um, as a public transit stop, it's not accessible to everyone and it needs to be accessible to everyone. So the solution is a complete streets policy. We've just talked about what complete streets looks like on the ground. So now let's talk about what a policy looks like and how we get to that outcome on the ground. So complete streets policies are about making sure our transportation network, uh, network works for all users every time there's a new project. Creating complete streets means transportation agencies must, must change their approach to community roads. By adopting a complete streets policy, communities direct their transportation planners and engineers to routinely design and operate the entire right of way to enable safe access for all users, regardless of age, ability, or mode of transportation. This means that every transportation project will make the street network better and safer for drivers, transit users, pedestrians, and bicyclists, making your town a better place to live. And I want to emphasize network, street network here, because again, not every street is going to have a bike lane and a sidewalk and a dedicated bus lane and, you know, all of the infrastructure for all users, although some of them will. However, a network of residential streets where the traffic is moving slowly and bicyclists can, and uh, pedestrians can easily be on the street and share with cars uh, also is part of the network. And so we're talking about having routes through a community that are safe for everyone, not that every street has to have um, the ultimate number of pedestrian and bicycle treatment. So complete streets um, are not about special projects. It's about changing the way we approach transportation projects on all streets. It's not about specific design elements. The implementation of complete streets is flexible and context sensitive. Adopting a policy doesn't mean that all roads will be changed at once. Changes can be made a little at a time and done with routine maintenance, um, such as when you're repaving a street, maybe you strike the lanes narrower. Um, so that cars move slower. We know that when lanes are narrower, cars will move slower. And that can be folded into your repaving um, plan. Complete streets won't address all concerns, which will still need attention. And th that includes land use concerns, how we build our communities, how close we are building neighborhoods to destination places like grocery stores or shopping centers. Um, but complete streets policies are one important piece in ensuring our states are fiscally and physically healthy. And so there's many types of streets. We see complete streets in rural areas um, that complement the surrounding community. We, and I love this next this, this picture of the shared street. Because again, this street just works. It's not about having specific infrastructure. It's just about a street that is through a community where bicyclists and pedestrians and are all safe. Somebody using a wheelchair could use this street. If a kid's ball rolled out in the street, the cars are not moving fast, and it's just a safe street, a shared street concept. And when um, and, and here we have skinny street, and this is a use of on-street parking. When you have on-street parking, it narrows the street, and then therefore cars have to go slower. We also see that this street has a sidewalk with a tree lawn there, so there is some separation between people and traffic, even without the um, parked cars. And here we see, you know, this is a small town, but we see a lot of pedestrian bike infrastructure because we want people to be able to access these businesses. And even if somebody drove here, it's great if they could park once and then walk around to all these local shops, have lunch, window shop, hopefully be purchasing things because that's great for our community. Um, so here we do, we see wider sidewalks. We see trees, you know, separating, again, the people and the traffic. We see bike lanes, really great bike lanes that are different colors, which is heightens visibility. Um, we have a mid-block crossing there with the pedestrian sign that's in yellow. And so while there's not a traffic light there, there is still a crosswalk, and it's alerting drivers to the fact that pedestrians will be crossing. 
<clears throat> and then we have the very urban example um, of complete streets, where we have very wide sidewalks. You see a lot of public transit infrastructure. There's a bus only lane. There's bus shelters. I'm sure if we moved up to the next intersection, there would be, you know, really wide um, crosswalks. And so, really, we see examples from urban to rural areas where complete streets work. So just a couple more types of treatment. Traffic circles are raised islands typically placed in the middle of four-way intersections. Traffic circles are used to address, to address speeding and traffic accidents and are most effective on neighborhood streets. So traffic circles reduce accidents and vehicle speeds, but, are not necessarily, but do not necessarily reduce traffic volume, which benefits residents on adjacent streets by avoiding traffic diversion and residents on treated streets by traffic calming. So what we don't want to see is when we calm traffic on one street and then the cars just go to another street in the neighborhood. So traffic circles allow the traffic to move, to still flow, but also allow a safer, um, a safer route for bicyclists, for example. Neighborhood greenways are another type of street that are slow speed, low volume streets where neighborhood residents who are walking or bicycling are given priority. Designing streets as uh, neighborhood greenways reduces automobile speeds and cut through traffic. They provide safer, more attractive bicycling and walking links, and they make residential streets safer and quieter. In developing neighborhood greenways, planners and designers utilize tools, including special signage, bicycle-friendly speed bumps, and adding traffic barriers. Neighborhood greenways are opportunities for creative landscaping, public art, and community spaces. For example, in Portland, Oregon, planners use a variety of infrastructure tools to develop an extensive neighborhood greenway network that allows bicyclists, com um, bicycle that allows bicyclists comfortable and safe ways to move through the city, including crossing larger streets. And this goes back to talking about the street network. So this is a network of neighborhood streets um, that they've that they developed that still gets people across town where they need to go. Um, and they, you know, at, at the places where these greenways intersect the larger streets, they make sure that there's good infrastructure at those intersections to get people across the street safely. So this is a, um, an example of a parking treatment. The angled head out parking is on street parking where drivers back into the parking spaces, placing the rear of the car closest to the curb. And this improves safety for the occupants of the car and for passing vehicles and bicyclists. Head out angled parking provides drivers entering traffic with greater visibility, decreasing the likelihood of crashes. By changing the orientation of the car so the trunk is close to the curb, angled out parking improves safety for children getting out of the car and people loading items in their trunk. In the first four years of implementation in Tucson, Arizona, uh, treated segments went from three to four auto bicycle crashes a month to no reported crashes. This type of parking benefits local economies because it uses less curb space per car than traditional parallel parking, and it's often used on main streets. So I hope you're starting to see that complete streets look, uh, have a variety of looks and treatments, and it's really about fitting complete streets to your community. Cycle tracks are something that we are starting to see in the region. There are a few in D.C. They are on-street bicycle facilities that actually separate vehicle, travel lanes, parking lanes, and sidewalks by a physical structure, either medians or bollards um, or even markings, but, but we prefer the physical structure. Um, cycle tracks combine the user experience of a separated path with the on-street convenience of a conventional lane. In separating bicyclists from automobile traffic, cycle tracks can make bicyclists feel more comfortable and attract new bicyclists because we know that when people feel safe, more people choose to ride. They also clarify expected behavior of the bicyclist for both the bicyclists and the automobiles, which decreases the risk that the bicyclist will be hit by opening car doors. Cycle tracks are growing in popularity in North America and can be found in um, Cambridge, Massachusetts, New York, Portland, and again, D.C. In Montreal, streets with this treatment have two and a half as many bicyclists and 28% lower injury rate than streets without cycle tracks. So again, we see an example just like the sidewalks where if we build the infrastructure, people are safer. 
So we are getting into our last few treatments and types of complete treats to talk about. This is the modern roundabout where you channel intersection traffic into a circular pattern where incoming traffic yields the flow of traffic within the roundabout. They are effective tools in urban and rural areas at major intersections and near freeways to improve safety and manage speed. Converting to a modern roundabout can lead to dramatic reductions in severe traffic accidents. Up to 82% when converting from a two-way stop controlled mechanism and up to 78% when converting from a signalized intersection. And the Federal Highway Administration recommends modern roundabouts for new and retrofit construction. So there's um, a national use guide for development of bicycle facilities from AASHTO, which is a large organization focusing on um, transportation facilities. And it, it recommends adding paved shoulders to rural roads, which accommodate bicyclists. Paved shoulders create space for those traveling by bike and by foot on these roads. Because these user groups are not competing for space at different travel speeds, paved shoulders help improve safety for all. So shoulders are also a useful tool for those who are driving, providing safe space, um, providing safe space for the car to pull over if needed. Many state policies have provided paved shoulders, and in the Wisconsin DOT, for example, paved three-foot shoulder on highways where daily automobile traffic exceeds 1,000 vehicles if bicyclists regularly use the road. So I hope you've seen from these examples that really complete streets can work in any community. It's very versatile, and um, it, there's a really a lot of options to make streets safer for everybody. So this um, information is from the National Complete Streets Organization, and their website has a lot of resources, including fact sheets. They track all the policies in the country, so it's very easy to go to the website and see policy, all the policies that have been adopted, if, either if you want to see policies that are near you or find towns that are of similar size as your community. Um, they have research and publications and information on federal policy as well. They also have social media listed on their website that you can join for the latest updates. So we want to say a quick thank you to the National Complete Streets Steering Committee because, again, they make this presentation available and a wealth of other resources available for free. And this presentation was used with permission under a Creative Commons license. And so we're really excited, Marisa and I are really excited to continue the Complete Truth conversation. And so uh, we, our contact information is on the screen, but we are also happy to answer any questions right now. But please feel free to contact us in the future. And you want to go over the chat box, please? Sure. So if you, um, we're at the point that we're ready to answer any questions or address some of the comments that have been streaming in during the presentation. Um, so for any of you who have not yet taken advantage of asking questions, we invite you to ask questions. Um, or make comments by typing in the chat box in the GoToMeeting control panel on the side of the screen. So we'll start with one of the questions that we have, which asks, uh, we have, our town has one streetscaping project. Is that the same as a complete street? So Christine, maybe do you want to address that? Sure. Um, while a streetscaping project could be the outcome, you know, could include complete streets you know, making sure all users of all abilities are taken into consideration. It is not a complete street policy. What we want to see is that in the, um, in the beginning, when we're planning and designing all of our streets, for every street in the community, that complete streets are being applied and that, and that policy is being applied. So, um, so a streetscaping project in itself is not a complete street. Great. Um, we just had another question come in. Just a reminder to folks that we will be sending out, um, we can send out the slides and we will also be posting the recording of this webinar online. Um, so we have another question about local examples here from Maryland and Virginia. We see the majority of our audience is from Maryland and Virginia. Um, so I think this is a great time to just reiterate that both the Help Keeping Active Living Cities and Towns campaign, um, the Mid-Atlantic, and the Safe Routes to School um, National Partnership 
are both resources that are available to help you and your town work on this. Um, and I can just mention two examples, one from each state um, of municipalities that have adopted these policies. So in Virginia, Roanoke, Virginia has a great example of a complete streets policy. Um, and in Maryland, we like to reference Rockville, Maryland's complete streets policy. Um, but as Ian mentioned, also on the completestreets.org website, there is a map that shows all of the policies that are listed. Um, so that's a great um, a great resource for you. Okay, so we have another question. Um, so do complete streets mean that we have to put a bike lane and a sidewalk on every road? Which hopefully we, we, we try to clarify this during the presentation, and the answer is no. We really want to see the network of, of pedestrian and bicycle and transit access through the community. So there should be options for routes, and there should be a variety of routes, but it does not mean that every single street will have sidewalks and bike lanes. So this is your chance to get in any burning questions. So we really appreciate your time in joining us today. We're wrapping up a little early. Um, and again, Marisa and I's information are on the screen, and you can contact us with any further questions. We are here as a resource for you. We also have um, information on our website. So if you would contact us, we can definitely point you in the direction of those existing resources. Um, and within the next week, you can be on the lookout for a link to the recording of this webinar, um, as well as the slides, if that would be helpful to you. Um, and again, thank you for your participation. On behalf of the Institute for Public Health Innovation and the Heal Cities and Towns Campaign for the Mid-Atlantic and the Greater Washington, D.C. Safe Routes to School Regional Network, Thank you for joining us and taking time to participate in our webinar. We hope that you have a wonderful day.